Welcome to the Great Beer State podcast from the Michigan Brewers Guild. The Great Beer State is a weekly show sharing conversations and stories from the passionate people who contribute to our vibrant Michigan beer community. It is made up of a mix between full-length archived interviews from the Guild's first documentary book project, A Rising Tide, Stories from the Michigan Brewers Guild, and conversations recorded in the here and now. Each episode is kicked off with a conversational update from host Scott Graham, Executive Director of the Guild, and the Brevangelist Fred Biltman, author of A Rising Tide. Here's Scott and Fred. Welcome to episode seven, Scott. Cheers. Well, Thank this- you. Cheers. Here we are. It's uh, Michigan Beer Month. Look, we're staring the uh, Independence Day holiday right in the eye. That's right. Michigan Beer Month. Uh, it's been something else. It's Michigan Beer Month in one hell of a year, that's for sure. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to be taking another interview out of the archives. We're talking to Rex Halfpenny, who with his wife Mary founded Michigan Beer Guide was a formative figure in the uh, in the creation and uh, beginning of the Michigan Brewers Guild history, so that should be interesting. Um, but as is tradition, we usually start with some updates from the for and from the brewers. What's new? Well, uh, lots of news just yesterday, July 1st. Uh, There are a number of bills that had been working their way through the state legislature that had passed and and just got signed into law. Uh, One package of a pretty good group of bills, large number of bills, and then another smaller group. And they have things that um, I think a lot of folks in our industry won't notice, some things that breweries will notice, some things that eventually enthusiasts will notice and you know and i think regular there's some things that consumers are going to notice too so it's kind of been on my mind all day trying to to summarize it share it with members and we've had some incoming feedback too so lots of news including a a new executive order out of the governor's office uh, which i guess is kind of our covid update Um, but uh, just yesterday we after seeing the rise of of positive cases in some areas in the state, we had a new executive order issued that said that certain bars have to close for indoor service and can only do takeout and outdoor service. And it's really focused at bars that have a large gathering of consumers, nightclub type places, but it says any bar that serves more than 70% of its gross revenue in alcohol, um, and that was not in the Northern Zones 6 and 8, had to close down for inside service. So that was that was big news. Yeah, so uh, it breaks. To it. a lot of folks. And so I, th- I also saw a lot of discussion about whether or not that applied to breweries. And maybe you can clarify for me. I, for, clearly, if you have a class C liquor license and if you don't serve food, you can't have indoor service. And then a little more trickily, if you serve food, but it's not above 30% of your business, you're included in that bar identification and you can't have indoor service. But if whether you're a brewery, brew pub, restaurant, whatever, if food is more than 30% of your business, then um, you can continue indoor service with the previous requirements, which is mask from door to table and all that stuff. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, our brew pub members have to have a retail liquor license, like a class C license in order to have their brew pub license. So it may affect them, but to keep your brew pub license, you have to sell at least 25% of your revenue in food on an annual basis anyway. So, but there is that sliver there between 25 and 30 where it could affect some of those members. And otherwise it applies to um, on-premise retail licensees and a, a brewery or microbrewery is not a retail license. It's a manufacturer's license and a tasting room license that goes along with it. 
So that ability to stay open or not does not affect them. Although interestingly enough, um, I've had a, a bunch of contact today because also in the executive order, it talks about some of the, the general rules and it talks about things like having to wear a mask when you come into or leave an establishment that you should stay seated uh, unless you're going to the bathroom or, or getting up to order food. And it also expressly states that if you're getting up to order alcohol, that, that you can't do that. That has to be table service. And we have um, a lot of members that are only taking orders at the bar behind a plexiglass with masks, with social distancing. And they're, they're pretty concerned because um, it changes the model, makes it more difficult, arguably less safe. And I don't think that was the intention. Um, but uh, it's, as with, with any time that these orders come out, there's, there's a lot of anxiety. And, and I certainly feel for all of our bar friends out there that, that sell Michigan beer and other beer and don't have a substantial food business, um, getting put back on takeout only or outdoors. If they have outdoor service, they can continue that. Yeah. So a uh, tough announcement for sure. Tough announcement. And then tough to sort of navigate if you're somewhere in that if you're close to the line, either way, you start navigating some pretty difficult wrinkles to understand whether you're in compliance or not. And, you know, and in general, of course, everybody more comfortable erring on the side of I'm clearly legal or I'm clearly healthy, but, you know, providing the appropriate amount of care. Some of these things are uh, sound interesting and difficult to navigate. But, you the know. question is: Will 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 a bar start selling hot dogs and potato chips for twenty bucks? Say, well, now crossed over, we're approaching the, the seventy percent threshold with alcohol. So let's get somebody to order another ten dollar hot dog. Did they determine in the? Uh, <laughs> is it when do they when it, it it matters when you take the snapshot of business too? Like, well, when is that over a month, over a year, this month? last month uh that all gets well, and i think the in, early pretty yeah I, yeah yeah and i i don't want to try and lawyer it here no me neither <laughs> um and i probably shouldn't be cracking the jokes but it did occur to me that maybe maybe you could have 25 dollar hot dogs <laughs> yeah way to go for the workaround scott yeah. it'll, it'll come back <laughs> You're not allowed to complain if you get charged 25 bucks for a hot dog. <laughs> yeah. That's what you just established. Um, so they're good. the bills that were going into law, if that serves as a COVID update, um, it, the bills that were going into law, are there details on, on those or is, that, or is that too soon? Nope, there are there are lots of details. In fact, more details than I want to get into because some of it starts to get so technical that I think it's boring. And, and some of the things, while they might mean something practically, I, I don't think they're really of a lot of interest to our podcast. I will touch on a couple of highlights. And the first one that impacts breweries, and I think the most significant is um, small breweries, uh, as of, I think it was 2015, but fairly recently, we're allowed to do some self-distribution. Uh, that is distribute their beer to uh, a retailer um, for the retailer to resell. And the limit previously was that you had to uh, sell in total less than a thousand barrels. And we saw some members starting to bump into that and say, I really don't think it's right for me and my business to assign a wholesaler to distribute my brands. I'd like to continue self-distributing. And the, the bill that was passed changes the limit to, to 2,000 barrels. So a brewery that hasn't decided to assigned its distribution rights to a distributor for a territory can self-distribute as long as they sell less than 2,000 barrels of beer a year total, not counting the beer that they sell to consumers at their tasting room. So that volume is now exempted and the cap goes from 1,000 to 2,000. So it's uh, more than doubling. And I think it gives a lot of folks who are seeing themselves bump into it 
some breathing room at least for the the immediate future. So that's that's a big deal. Self distribution is allowed um, in Michigan at a limit in a limited way. Some states in a much broader way. In some states, not at all. And it's um, it's important for small brewers to be able to get out and establish their brands and generate some revenue. Um, so it it, it really is. Um, it, 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 I would call it quite a con significant achievement. Yeah. Second bill that impact that impacts brewers and uh, consumers aren't really going to notice is change in the requirement for brand registration. And this was a law that said that any brew pub or microbrewery has to register their brands with the Liquor Control Commission, and they also have to file pricing for for territories with the Michigan Liquor Control Commission. And it seemed to not make any sense for a brew pub or even a, a microbrewery or brewery for that matter, if it's only selling its beer within its own four walls, uh, to have to go through that step. And some people were actually getting cited recently um, in the past couple of years by um, liquor control enforcement in some instances for that. And it, and so it's it's really nice to sort of make that process make more sense. So if a brewery is distributing a brand, they still have to register it. But if they're only selling it inside their own four walls, they no longer have to. So does that mean anything to the consumer? Probably not at all. But to breweries, especially a brew pub or a, a brewery that's only that's making a one-off brand and is only selling it in their own place, um, this is good news. Well, it could mean something to the consumer that they wouldn't necessarily see is that a brewer can be more comfortable making one-off products selling on tap because they're not outside of compliance because they didn't get a registration, meaning they can see some of those specialty beers um, and brands that uh, that licensee isn't encumbered with the need to register it if it's going to be sold at their pub. Is that right? That's true. So yeah. uh, we've got a the, little uh, bit of an update. The, the process... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Fred. Sorry. No. Nope. Oh, I was just backing up and saying we got a little update from our star producer, Shannon, in that the the metrics for whether you are 70% alcohol, 30% food exactly, is your 2019 business. And if you they weren't um, open for the entirety of 2019, it's from open date until present. So that's how you would gauge. So my hot dog, my twenty-five dollar hot dog idea is not going to fly. Uh, not for a little while. You'll have to ha sell some hot dogs for a while. <laughs> um, so anything else on that uh, legislative front, front, or do you want to jump into member updates? Well, there there are some other things, but I think they start to get into kind of tedious things that are important if you're a brewery owner or operator. But um, and where do those members I, I go I, for that information? Uh, we sent out a communication to our directly to our members with the basic update, and we always reference the the actual bill or public act so they can read it themselves and make their own interpretation. Uh, I think we'll see some news reporting on a couple of these things. I've talked to a couple of reporters, and again, I try and steer them away from things that I just, I just think it gets tedious and boring to, yeah. to many people. So the highlight would be there's been positive action. There's been uh, passing of action, and uh, check your inbox for updates uh, to get the actual bills and and uh, important news. And of course, uh, we're always open to talk in more detail with any of our members that have questions. Right on. So enthusiast, allied, uh, members updates, anything new in their world? Uh, yeah, another one of these bills that uh, the enthusiasts will eventually notice, I believe, is we've always ha operated under this law in Michigan that says that you cannot offer an unlimited quantity of quantity of beer to somebody for one fixed price. You can't pay one price and get all you can drink. 
Um, and I think that that's been not well understood maybe and frustrating when you go to a beer festival, especially if you've been to beer festivals in other states where this is not the case. We, it, the way we manage it is we have this exchange of tokens and a cup with a pour line and you have to, you know, so th there's a finite quantity based on your ticket price and you can buy more. Um, and it's kind of cumbersome. I don't think it really keeps people from drinking too much there we have the responsibility to watch that anyway um, but one of the changes allows us to consider at our beer festivals the the beer that a brewery samples to be just that a sample like it is in their tasting room and they can give it away um, without consideration that is without a with without being paid for it uh, we have to consider ju just what this means to us and how we want to operate. It's still very important to us to to be responsible with our alcohol service um, and have those points of control or measurement. So I'm not exactly sure what it's going to mean as we get um, back into a, hopefully a more normal situation with beer festivals, but it could well mean that we are, are not exchanging tokens. And, that uh, and behind the scenes, that means for mm -hmm. us... Uh, quite a bit less work in managing those tokens as well. Although I will say for our enthusiast members, we've got a core group that help us uh, um, pack the 15 tokens in little bags. If you've ever come through the gate at a festival and got a bag of tokens, they get in those little bags um, it, by people counting them and putting them in there. It's very not automated. Uh, so, um, anyway that that's kind of new and exciting and yes we were working on it and don't don't have definite plans just let on, yet on what it means to us but kind of interesting well also interesting because it relates to uh episode six with larry bell and this episode with rex uh, they both talk about working through the logistics of how michigan law was different where any of us that had beer festival experience at the time of starting our summer beer fest came from somewhere else with different laws. And so trying to start the summer beer festival had, a, had that wrinkle of, okay, how do we do this and stay out of jail? So interesting that here we are a couple decades later and uh, one of those big ones is, is getting relaxed. Yes, indeed. Indeed. So not, Again, continuing with legislative activity that consumers might notice, um, and, and some of this comes in the wake, actually a lot of uh, these, these bar things that are coming up come in the, the age of COVID and pandemic and being shut down and, and bars and restaurants trying to find ways to improve the revenue picture, especially looking at reduced capacities, but some things that, that uh, are not made permanent, but um, are at least temporary for now. We'll see if they get if they continue to get um, renewed or or made permanent. But the the opportunity to have what's called a social district now exists, and so a local government unit can determine a downtown area or some or an area as a social district district, and they can uh, allow. Um, licensees, whether it's a brewery or a bar or restaurant, to get a permit to offer beer for consumption in the social district. Um, so I don't think we're going to see these everywhere, but I'm sure we'll see them in some areas and it'll be a fun way to socialize, have a beer, um, and be able to kind of, in a controlled way, mingle through a common space. So and that's, that's that pretty cool. Passed? I'm looking forward to seeing that happen. That has passed yes. already? Yes. It, and so that would new. mean, so to me, yep. my understanding that would mean that they've removed, in, if that social district was created and approved by that um, community, then that erases that um, threshold of crossing the liquor license line, that you could be in a shared patio uh, in the past, because when we've, when uh, breweries or licensees have, you know, like closed their parking lot or the street, there was always that still, oh, but you can't. You can't leave the licensed area and go into that other area in front of the place next door. There was always that threshold. So that in the social district would be removed, uh, which would relax a lot of that's, things. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's correct. There certainly be rules that apply and people have to do things properly. Um, but yeah, you can imagine lots of settings where this could be fun. 
It's funny uh, being on the on the team for my local uh, festival, Goose Festival here in Fenville. Just last year, I was saying, you know, we we've wrestled with that and how to do some things on our downtown stretch when streets are closed. And I, I mean, I would have never imagined or wished for the reason that put this into motion. But I remember thinking, well, cities do this. Like it happened when somebody went to the legislature and said, "Come on." So, I mean, you know, we didn't have any chance of it or any thought of it being a chance. Um, but strange truth is stranger than fiction. Here we are. Because that was a Michigan. Yep. And this has a sunset uh, at, in, yep, in 2024, it's set to expire right now. But there's certainly a lot of time for it to get extended or for a lot of people to get upset with it. <laughs> Maybe yeah. have it not. So, it's um, so we'll see. That That's certainly a few. Yeah. So how, whether it works well or not might be might very well be up to humanity at large. So mind your P's yeah. and Q's, drink in the social districts responsibly, kindly, robustly. Exactly. Uh, another interesting thing I would mention is that um, bars and restaurants are now able to sell um, alcohol to go. So they can, as long as they um, don't package it ahead of time, they put it in a, a, a sealed in a, a sealed closed container uh, with no perforations or straw holes. So no, it won't be a kitty cup. <laughs> it won't have a straw in it. And they can it sell leaves. a beer, wine, mixed drinks. <laughs> yeah, um, they can sell these things to go, uh, and indeed they can deliver them as well with certain restrictions. So um, that's new. While you may have been able to go into some places and get takeout beer, you could not get a mixed drink. Uh, Does that go. have a uh, sunset? Now you'll be able to. So you'll be able to maybe get a, yeah, um, it has a sunset in 2025. So we'll see how that goes. Interesting. Well, anything else for the public before we jump into the Brewer's Dozen? There are a couple other things, but I still uh, think that we're getting too deep into the nitty gritty. And no, I'd like to talk about some other breweries. All right, let's do it. We're, we're going to share 13 breweries. Shout outs to breweries across the state, uh, which we do every week. Why don't you kick us off? Uh, let's think about Arbor Brewing Company in Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti, and also they have a location in Plymouth, which is newer. Yeah, long time members, been some change in, in that organization, but uh, they've been a staple of Michigan beer. Certainly have, going back to you know some of the earliest days with Matt and Renee Graff. And they, I don't have it in front of me, but our archived interview with uh, with those two is coming up in the next couple of weeks. So uh, you'll hear from them. They were part of the rising tide archive and, and they're due up imminently. Uh, we've got Austin brothers beer company in Alpena up in your neck of the woods. Yeah. Uh, I would say the Northeast corner of the lower peninsula is still has room to develop more breweries. It's one of the less populated areas. And, uh, and the Austin brothers are doing a great job. People are enjoying things there and, and they're, they're doing a real good job with their beer. Excellent. If they uh, get deer drinking beer. Brewery Vivant. Yeah, they do. They do. Of course. Millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brewery Vivant in Grand Rapids has been around for quite some years. And of course, Jason Spaulding has a history um, going back before he and his wife, Chris, opened Brewery Vivant. And last year they opened a, a second location with its own identity called Broadleaf Local Beer. And that's in Kentwood, which is also in the Grand Rapids area. Right on. By George Brewing Company in Munising. That one's new to me, by George. Yeah, well, there are now um, two... Uh, I think there are almost three breweries in Munising. There are two, um, with By George being the newest, and uh, I still haven't been there. I did a virtual visit um, with uh, the owner by phone. It sounds like a fun place. So I'm I'm sure that they are 
going to be busy this weekend. And I look forward to stopping there when I pass through Munising uh, as I drive through the UP. Nice. We got Jamesport Brewing Company in Ludington. So they are a, uh, a tiny engine that could as well. They've been a longtime member of the guild. Uh, Tom Buchanan uh, brewed there for a long time, served on the board. Uh, great place to go grab a beer and a bite. Yep, it's a fun brew pub that's a staple in downtown Ludington. And we have uh, Liquid Note Brewing in Otsego, which uh, again is kind of southwestern quadrant of Michigan, if you don't know where Otsego is. And Liquid Note is, is music themed, if you didn't get that. Uh, they have entertainment venue there, and it's kind of a two bar, or two location, not two bar, but two operation um, side by side. So Liquid Note is a brew pub, and then it's got, uh, they also own uh, the bar and restaurant next door. So it's it's an interesting kind of hybrid operation. And it, and again, they're one of our newer members, only having been open at the brew pub location for a couple of years. Nice. We've got Elk Brewing in both Comstock Park and Grand Rapids. Yeah, Elk is, uh, of course, right across the street from the Fifth Third Ballpark where we have our winter beer festival. And and the, the brewery, I guess it's an offshoot, although it's much bigger than the original Elk Brewing. Um, I want to say on Wealthy Street, but I think I'm wrong. So uh, in, in, in Grand Rapids, at right the on. risk of being wrong. <laughs> but yeah, and, and then uh, getting further down in the southwest portion of the Lower Peninsula, we've got Haymarket Brewery and Tap Room in Bridgman. Yeah, that's a great place. Uh, I've had the pleasure of playing music there a couple of times. They've got a, a sister. They're founded. Their original brewery is uh, and pub is in Chicago. So they kind of straddle the line there. It's a nice, uh, great pub with great outdoor space and production brewery as well. Pawpaw Brewing <laughs> Company in Pawpaw. Again, we're in the southwest corner. Um, Papa has been around for quite a few years now. Uh, love their logo, two paws, and enjoy drinking their beer, that's for sure. Right on. River Rouge Brewing Company in Royal Oak, Michigan. Yeah, I'd give a shout out to Edward Stencil. Uh, he and his wife own that place. He's a very hands-on operator. It's a small, uh, small brewery. Edward's a very interesting fellow. He's on our board of directors. I've really gotten to know him. He's helped out at our summer beer festival and become part of that team. Uh, and he's actually working on a second location, if you can believe it. He started before all of this uh, pandemic business and he's working on another location, not too far from Royal Oak. But um, I really am a fan of Edward's and Looking forward to getting to his new place, in addition to River Rouge. Right on. Who's next? Territorial Brewing Company in Springfield. We also have Third Nature they, Brewing. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, they, they focus on some lager beers at Territorial and it's always fun and refreshing for me to get a lager beer. So, um, so I appreciate that. Cheers to Tim and the crew there. Yeah. Cheers to classic lagers. And next up is third nature brewing company in Rockford, Michigan. Third nature is another one of our newer members. Uh, I, I believe it's a ground up construction. It's a, a beautiful place. They've got a nice brewery there and a restaurant and tasting room. They did a fabulous job. And last but not least, another one of our longtime members, Woodward Avenue Brewers in Ferndale. Yep, they're definitely one of the early entries on in the state in general uh, once you know, after the kind of the first 
three to five, uh, they've got to be in that. Uh, I, it, I sort of think of it as a first wave, but it's really Michigan's second wave was that mid to late 90s run. Yeah, and they're still there, and I hope they're having great success this year. Um, good to see a staple continue to be part of the crew. Absolutely. So that brings us to kicking off the uh, interview. We decided to do two archived interviews in a row here, and I think they're uh, you'll find that a lot of these early ones uh, are have a lot of shared memories, meaning we're we're frequently hearing um, the story of our first gathering, the uh, first formation as an organization, what the market was like, what the conversations were like, what that actual first meeting was like, leading up to the first festival. I think that's going to be a theme you hear through. Um, more than a few interviews, but uh, with Larry and Rex, I thought it was a really interesting um, sort of bookend, so to speak. Um, Rex being the instigator that sort of uh, was connecting, he was founding, had founded the Michigan Beer Guide and was the one talking to all the breweries and, and kind of calling us out and saying, you guys gotta get in the room, talk to each other. And so, um, I think it's really interesting to hear his perspective um, and part of that shared vision and shared memory of, of how all this came to be. Yeah, I think that really makes me think of the great part about this whole project, Fred, which is that these firsthand stories and the way they remember it and perceive it, um, you know, are being you know, have been captured through these interviews and, and, and anybody that wants to can now get that perspective from that person. So I, I just, I'm really glad that this project um, is something that happened and look forward to capturing more interviews that are recording things that are going on now that will be similarly meaningful in years to come. So it, it, it really underscores what a cool project this is and what an opportunity it is to hear firsthand about uh, the early days of Michigan's brewing renaissance, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, credit to Rex and, and a lot of the uh, people and characters that are uh, highlighted in these interviews, because I think, you know, it was sort of bold characters and sort of, um, I don't know how else to say it, sort of bold maneuvers to make things happen when when there was probably 10 more reasons to not do it. So I think that um, our, in terms of the history of our, our age of brewing in this state, we came together much earlier than most states did. And that was partly because of Rex's urging and certainly, um, you know, he kind of pushed the, the issue. Um, and and then a lot happened from that, that initial instigation. But, uh, you know, people have probably heard me say this a lot of times. I'm sure you've said it as well. I think that um, our work together in those first few years set the stage for decades. Uh, it established the, the connective tissue and the relationships that uh, then went on to do other great things. But without that initial uh, joining, uh, so many other things may not have uh, grown up the way they did. So kudos to Rex. Yeah, for, and last uh, year, Rex and Mary, yeah, they they retired the Michigan Beer Guide and kind of retired from that project uh, last year after I believe it was 23 years. So yeah. uh, cheers to Rex and Mary Halfpenny. Yeah, cheers and congratulations on your retirement. Uh, thanks for the work you did. And it uh, seems like a great point to hand it off. So uh, taped in the fall of 2018 at Motor City Brewery Works, here's Rex Halfpenny, founder of Michigan Beer Guide. Cheers. It's been a while to uh, realize the ground we've covered and time marches on. All it's been a we're, wonderful we're, ride. Yeah. It has met expectations in certain ways and it has not met expectations yeah. in certain ways. I, 
I thought beer was going to be huge. It was going to be bigger. It was, and we'd have greater market share than we have right now. Craft beer as opposed to. When did to, you first think that? Right off the bat. I mean, back yeah. when I was in California in the early 80s, I knew this alternative beer, this ethnic diversity of bread was going to far exceed American white bread. It was just going to blow the doors away from yeah. it. And when I came to Michigan, there, was, it, there wasn't craft here. And even Bell had the same license as Stroh in yeah. 1988. Yeah, and what, did you, what year did you arrive? 88. That's so 88. So I came so there here. There were a couple breweries, but they were in the same. Yeah, same there was Stro, there was Stro, and there was Frankenmuth, and there was Bell. Yeah, and and uh, and thank God for Bells and and you guys, because that's where I found my craft beer. Went to visit you guys and saw people hand labeling bottles upside down and all kinds of which ways and beer labels on white plain white cartons upside down and sideways and hey, they were securely affixed with rubber cement and, and with rubber cement <laughs> yeah those were interesting so days. even in california though early mid 80s you're still talking about a, 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 a small collection but you know you got things like anchor and sierra but anchor, even that sierra. was a was a small but I growing was scene for i you was to have visiting breweries left and right over yeah. there i was it, from about 82 when I first visited Anchor and I first visited Ken Grossman at Sierra Nevada Brewing Company in a pole barn in the back of a parking lot. Yeah. You know, I was going and visiting these people and, and my job, you know, from Hawaii to California took me up to Seattle and Seattle, it was popping. Seattle and Portland were yeah. microbrewery heaven, Red Hook, Portland, Widmer. Those guys were just kicking ass. And, yeah. and I was riding my 10 speed to all these breweries and just drinking You're beer. You're like the original beer time. tourist. I was a beer tourist. Yeah, but like in a time where, you know, it's uh, there, yeah. that wasn't a thing yet. No, and, and, that's, and I wanted to do that in Michigan, but there wasn't anything to do in Michigan. Yeah. And I saw Bell. I saw Frankenmuth. And I wasn't interested in Stroh at the time. And they, they shut down their thing in 85 anyway. But I quit corporate America in 96 to somehow do something in the beer industry. Uh, I was bored with my corporate life and I wanted to do something for myself. And at that point in time, there were like 30 Michigan breweries. So Mary and I went out, we visited them. And we, we thought, you know, I, I kind of thought I was going to do a brewery. That's kind of where my head was at. And I wanted to go learn from the different breweries. And what I found was the breweries knew of each other, but nobody talked to each other. There was no community. You know, there was I feel like I'm remembering this phone call. <laughs> yeah, right. We had conversations and I sent out a, a, a letter, a, a form, a survey asking. Pe anyway, I'm getting well, ahead back, of myself. Yeah, let's back up yeah, a minute. Yeah. So because you and Mary are visiting breweries and um, and you're thinking about a brewery. And, and at what point does that sort of change and shift into Good. to what you started with a beer Good. guide, because that Good. was prior to yeah. ringing on our phones and, yeah. and, yeah. and t talking to us. Great question. That and that, it, it goes back to my job in corporate America, where I was in the middle of the hourglass. I had corporate above me and, and the field, yeah. all the people, out, the 600 offices out in the field from coast to coast below me. And I came out of the field from Hawaii to California to, to Washington to Alaska. And I was brought to Michigan to do for the company what I had done for the West Coast, because I was, I was quite a, I was very successful in corporate America. So they brought me over here, and I was the guy who had to take the, what the field needed, convey it to headquarters, and take headquarters instructions and convey it to the field. And as I went around and I visited the brewery, I saw that there was a disconnect between the consumer and the breweries and the breweries and the breweries, and I thought, I should just do for beer what I had done in corporate America and be that conduit and take the information from all the different breweries, network the breweries into a collective voice to speak to the consumers and educate the consumers about beer, which yeah. is essentially what I did in corporate America. Yeah. And that was the foundation of Michigan Beer Guide. And, and to do that, in my research, I read something about if you're gonna be a publisher and a writer on a field, you need to become an expert in that field. So besides just drinking a lot of beer and loving beer and traveling to go do beer, beer things, I became a certified beer judge. I started working to not only start the Michigan Brewers Guild, but legalize home brewing in Michigan. So I had 
pretty much centered myself in the beer industry and worked to become an SME, a subject matter expert, where I could speak to brewers about how to brew and how beer was made. I'd been a home brewer for 10 years. And, um, and take that information and not just be the tourist enthusiast, yeah. but be somebody who could speak intelligently and take that information and convey it to the consumer, which yeah. I think was really vital. And if, if in those days when we started Michigan Beer Guide in February of 97, we were a monthly. And every single month, I, and there were 30 breweries, right? There were 30 breweries, right? And by the end of the year, there was like 49 breweries. So it was popping relatively yeah. back then. But then it was, it was incredible seeing that there was three. Yeah, right. Um, you know, From, six, yeah. you know, five years before. Yeah, right? it, it, it had just happened. And, and because like me, discovering beer on the West Coast, entrepreneurs here had gone to the West Coast or gone to Europe and discovered beer and brought the concept back to Michigan. And, and we're sitting at the epicenter right now in Motor City Brewing Works and Traffic Jam and Bed Edwards and, 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 those, and, and those early days, Grand Rapids Brewing Company as well, uh, the formative years of trying to legalize microbreweries and brew pubs in this state, which we got in, in you know, in 94. 93, 94. Yeah, I think it was 93. Um, uh, can't be sure. What? So was the homebrew legalization and the uh, microbrew brew pub legalization, was that happening on a parallel Simultaneously, process? Simultaneously. I was working on both. If you read the first 12 issues of Michigan Beer Guide, it unfolds these ideas. And I talk about, let's legalize home brewing. And what if all the brewers got together? And wouldn't it be cool if we could have a collective voice? And month after month, I was doing this. You know, I started in February, March, April, May. By about issue eight, uh, we had House Bill 4850 in the House Senate. And, and it was moving right along. And in, I think it was August, where the State Regulatory Affairs Committee called me and said, Rex, call your people off. We get it, <laughs> and, and Governor so, Engler signed it into law. So homebrew was later. significant later if it was post beer guide, because the the micro brewery license was before was the pro, beer guide. pre beer guide. Yeah, but so they but, were sort of, but they were they're all in that camp. I was just trying to make sure I understood the timeline because I now that we're talking about, it, I remember the homebrew thing because it seemed so late. Like, oh, was, you mean this thing that everybody's doing? Yeah, we were, were going to legalize doing, it. Yeah, like, we were all doing. Um, but I totally I. Oh, completely left my mind. I would have. I would have told somebody it had always been legal. Like no. uh, without. Now I remember. Um, it was in Zymergy magazine where they had the blue states and the red states. Yeah. And we were like one of the six red states. Uh -huh. And I'm like, no. Yeah. You know, we got. I, I know there's eight homebrew supply shops, and I belong to the Pontiac Brewers Tribe. We'd I was been making, breweries. We'd all been brewing all brewery. this time, and I said, let's make it legal. So we started a letter writing campaign. I had the American Home Brewers Association start sending Zymergy to all the, the regulatory affairs committee. And we just started, we had rallies at Big Buck Brewery. We had all the home brewers there. We signed petitions and yeah. we were just on it. And this is, this is right when we were having the meetings to start the guild. Yeah, so let's go there. So, um, I mean, there's a whole lot to talk about with the beer guide. You and I could, could spend an afternoon talking, but for this particular project, I'm gonna kind of narrow the lens um, and and talk about how this community came together overall, the arc of of, of the brewing community and the arc of the Michigan Brewers Guild. So, uh, and you were instrumental in beginning in those conversations. Yeah. Um, you started already, but tell me again about the inspiration and then what the what your first steps were to uh, reaching out to breweries. Good, good. I, uh, when, when Mary and I recognized that we thought we could be a greater benefit to the industry by being that conduit for the industry, and that, and then I, in, in issue eight, I put out an editorial that said, wouldn't it be a good idea? And the response from you guys, from the 30 or so breweries, was yes, let's do it. But you had the brilliant idea and the nerve, I might say, <laughs> that we had to meet in neutral territory. Oh, uh, yeah. I won't have my product or somebody else's product. So we had, I found a Bud Bar yeah. in Saginaw, <laughs> and, and we met there on completely neutral ground, and there were uh, uh, 40 or 50 people there in little groups. 
Because he feel like it was wise at the time, but I tell you, looking back, it's times where I'm like, that seems pretty petty. <laughs> but pretty I petty. think it's a parameter where we were. <laughs> it is exactly uh, that. Especially as a larger brewer, it's because exactly that. attentions. We I think there's a lot of excitement about what was happening, but it was tense. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it and it was still roses. competitive, and we yeah. weren't, and we didn't even, we didn't share each other's beer. We didn't talk to each other. But we didn't see the breweries didn't even see each other. I no, think except for no. maybe, maybe Nobody maybe said East Side was a little different because some of them were were in these little clusters. Yeah. But the rest of the state, you were on islands yeah. and doing your work. Yeah. And and uh, so, so the word of another brewery was was referred to you by somebody by the consumers and the people like you that were going from brewery to brewery. We didn't know their faces. We didn't know their beer. I think so it was really interesting. We time. published Michigan Beer Guide, and in it were 30 breweries. Name, address, phone. These are the beers. Yeah. And I made the list so that you could check off. So, so guys like me could go visit a brewery and say, I've had, I've had this, I've had this, I've and had for this. for operating breweries who were, who were essentially confined to their four walls out of, out of necessity of, yeah, of building their business, uh, I think that was, it's an also an interesting thing to think of. Like, we were hearing about breweries opening that yeah. we had no idea yeah. of. Yeah. And you're getting this sort of bulletin, like the Pony Express dropping off a, a So note. I would, I would ask, yeah. how about, a, how about a, a collective organization, a unified yeah. voice? And, and why don't we have it? And the response was, we're too busy. Yeah. We are too busy. It's a good idea, but we're too busy. Plus... There's so many different motivations out there. Who has the time to unify that voice? Yeah. Those were, those were the legitimate responses I got. Yeah. Good and, idea. I'm not doing it. Good idea. I'm not doing it. Who's going to do it? So I said, I'm going to do it. And, yeah. and we, we took our time. We, we created a survey and we mailed it out to every single brewery. And we got back all these surveys and everybody said it's a good time. But the motivations were all different. I want one license. I want to keep the license separate. I want self-distribution. I don't want distribution. You know, I want to increase barrelage. I don't want to increase barrelage. It, there was just all these different motivations, and I couldn't get people to agree. But what they agreed on was let's try to get together. And so yeah. we met on October 22nd, 97, and we had our, our meeting at that pub yeah. in Saginaw. Hamilton Street Pub. Hamilton Street Pub. Neutral territory. Yeah. And at the end of that, we all agreed it's a good idea. And I put out another survey, say, what do you want to do? And the response was all over the world, all over the place. And we met the second time in December at Michigan Brewing Company yep. when we actually said, let's form the Michigan Brewers Guild. What are we going to be about? I want to sell more of my own beer. That was the only unanimous decision I had. Yeah. So I said, sell Michigan beer. Let's drink Michigan beer. And that was the foundation of, and my checks still say, drink Michigan beer. Yeah, I remember, I remember making a bumper sticker. I think it was yes. even prior to that meeting. Yes. Uh, that uh, it was like, we was like, let's simplify this shit. It was, it was a marketing organization and I was envisioning radio spots and billboards, and we were just going to, to do this. And the fundamental first thing we were going to do is we needed money. We had no money as an organization. And yeah, and no prospect of drawing any from our members. So like had, there wasn't money in the organization. There wasn't money in the ring of people. It yeah. had all been spent. Yeah. You know? So we decided to have a festival. Yep. Brand new organization. And that June, man, we had our first festival in Livonia. Yeah. And I remember the conversations around that. Uh, you know, this is all trying to collect, collect some common ground, which yeah. at times, if you read the, if you read the surveys and, uh, you know, that had to be something for you. If you talked to us and read the surveys, at times it seemed like there's very little. But the things that were common... What you already mentioned was we want to sell more of my beer. We want to sell more Michigan beer. Yep. And I thought it was... It was um, it was focusing uh, in that the festival did the two things we it needed. Everybody it everybody raised it. money. Well, it had the potential of raising money, and, and it would promote the idea. It had the potential to encourage yes. the sale of more beer. So it was yeah. like, again, it was, we had a very, very narrow landing strip for people to come together, but we found it yeah. through the conversations you instigated, yeah. Yeah. and I think through the, you know, you were poking the bear, you were poking multiple bears in terms of... Uh, 
getting people with very strong opinions to speak their mind so you could parse it out and figure out yeah. well what wh yeah. where are the threads that can come together <clears throat> that was it was and the festival it was came fun. out of that it was a lot of work uh, we were a monthly publication and it was our it became our full-time job but i knew how to work cuz i just come out of corporate america so we just we just went all in and i got to believe there were those of us that had been to I mean, beer tastings, beer festivals, they were a different beast back then. They weren't really known by the greater public. They were happening. Uh, so, like, I had been going to the Great Taste Midwest for probably three or yeah. four years at yeah. that point. And I think other brewers that had been around or come from other parts of the country, like Colorado or California, had experienced drinking samples of multiple breweries in a park on a Saturday. The festival idea. Uh, the festival right. idea. But I got to believe, looking at that population, there are breweries who had never even been to a festival. No uh, being asked to pour their beer at a festival. Yeah. Like, I, I just, I got to believe our, our group was made up of, of people who this was a completely brand new idea and some that were bringing their, yeah. bringing their experiences to fore. Yeah, that's an interesting concept when you recognize the fact that they were home brewers, for the most part, entrepreneurs, and what didn't come up in all those meetings, interestingly, was education, mm -hmm. teach me, instruct me. How do I make better beer? How do I stabilize my beer? How do I increase shelf life? How do I bottle? How do I package? How? None of those kind of issues were brought up. Yeah. Everybody thought they knew how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, their friends and neighbors drank their beer. So, I, you know, I know how to make beer. And, and so we weren't, we had no technical charter in that original yeah. in that and original it wasn't thing. what we had in common it wasn't what we had in we common. probably wouldn't have survived if if we made yeah. it our charter yeah um, you know i based i came from the west coast and california had a guild and washington had a guild and portland had a guild and and i based the fest i ran that first festival the first two festivals and my model was the oregon brewers festival and that's where the token idea came from because yeah. they had been using token the difference there is they had no admission you yeah. walked right through the park, but right. if you wanted a drink, you had to buy the cup and the tokens. Yeah. So they had 90,000 people, but how many thousands of them were just people well, with and baby we, carriages? And we had a little different legal picture here yeah, in terms had, of yeah. satisfying our regulations, so yeah. it needed to be yeah. uh, put through the yeah. Michigan um, machine, so to speak. Yeah, um, but, it, but, but it was, the festival acted as that nucleation point because it, it actually put brewers in each other's faces and to try each other's beers. Yeah. And, and because brewers weren't tourists the way I was a tourist, they weren't experiencing each other. And, and to, the, to this very day, a lot of them don't get out. Um, and if, you know, there's 400 of you now. That right. Do it. But if 40. you look at the, uh, you know, we're talking to 30 people for this sort of bite-sized yeah. project. Yeah because there's another 30 or 40 I want to talk to you. Um, but I mean, if you, if you, if you look at this, the, the ring of the people that were involved in the 90s, we have 20 year relationships because we drank yes. each other's beer at some point. Yeah, yeah. We, we got out yeah. and we weren't going to. You know, um, I look back and I look at, at the, the board and all those people on the board, that first board are still active with one exception, that's Scott Henderson. And yep. Scott had a series of bad luck. And, and so he kind of went out of the picture, came back into the picture, dabbled, but made it his success as energy drinks. And, yeah. and it's good to see him still around and still, still busy and brewing, if you will. Yeah. So, although it's, anyway. Uh, but everybody, Rene Griff and John Leonardos and, and Drew Ciara and, and you and Larry. And I mean, it's those people that, that were, the, were the hub of the industry and are still active in, well, the Rene, Rene and, and engaged and, in one way, shape or form, yeah, regardless yeah. of whether the, their business is as it was. Yeah. I mean, they're still engaged. They're still well, they still are. But they, yeah. but they're they've kind of become a, a much larger, greater thing. And, and, yeah. and yeah. Matt and Rene. Yeah. So I don't want to I don't want to spend too much time on the first festival or two because we could spend all day on it. But I do want to I just want to circle back to like. So, you know, let's talk about like a couple of weeks before the festival, what's going through your head and what are the challenges and what were the, what were the things that could have kept it from happening or that you were worried about? And then, and then let's, let's proceed after that to kind of like the drive home and the weeks after, what do you think happened oh, afterward? It, well, it, it, they were very stressful for Mary and I. 
we had a lot of elements in play. We were relying on a lot of people, you know, and it was everything from porta potties to tables and covers and 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 uh, and the tents and uh, and and orchestra. And keep in mind that we there's a Michigan law that says a brewer can't pour their own product to a consumer. So we had to have volunteers, and we we networked with homebrew clubs. So if you remember, we had homebrew clubs. We yeah. put T-shirts on them. Renee was our first volunteer coordinator and she had to give the speech to tell everybody they had to get a ticket and they had to pour three ounces and make sure and yeah. all that kind of stuff and and to keep all everything legal and above board and watch for drunkenness and all that all that kind of stuff and we got to buy the beer from the wholesalers we, and we had to uh -huh. we had to buy the beer from a wholesaler which was problematic but rave stepped in to help us a great deal by saying, you know, they'll they'll short term book all this stuff. And, and yeah, that was anyway, there was a, what sort of money do you think we put in play to host the festival before? Oh, I didn't keep any of that kind of stuff. But you look at the tent, the Porta Johns and the tables and the, the snow fencing that we ultimately used and then meeting with the, the, the health people and learning we had to have backflow valves on all the hoses and we had to have screens around food service. I and mean, it was just all these kind of things that we were being confronted with for the first time. And we didn't have cell phones in those days. <laughs> so Mary and I and Drew and I don't know who else, we had Clearcom. Yeah. We were on, we we were on walkie email. talkies basically. And so we were, we were walking around talking to each other and I was getting dragged from here to there. And, Drew was in the trailer counting money all the time. <laughs> and we had to have an armored car because he was worried about, about getting held up. So we had an armored car pick up and take the money to the bank. There was, Fred, at the end of the whole thing, Mary and I just were like the balloon that got popped. And we both just went. Pshh. Yeah. And for two days, I think we just. And what did we have? 800 people, I think. Actually, the count was 600. 600 people. Yeah, that's probably 100 of us in the, in the tent, <laughs> right? So it was 600 yeah, yeah, yeah. people in the first year in Livonia. Yeah. And, and, and Livonia had their SWAT team right outside the gate, and they were breathalyzing people at the first stoplight before they got out of the, they got out of the county yeah. or out of their jurisdiction. And so there are all these things, all these stresses. Um, the, the, because of the state, I got written up with 10 violations. Not one was you were pouring beer out of Jake, great big magnum bottles the way you had done for years in Madison. <laughs> and that right. was a health violation. And I got slapped with these health violations. Uh, I got slapped with all these codes. And I remember having a meeting with the board and John just pissed it all off. He said, ah, it'll all blow away. And I'm like, it's my name on all this stuff, man. Yeah, so <laughs> it was really stressful. How did that get reconciled? I just met with them and I said, you know, these were limited incidences that won't happen again. And we had we had another one the, the subsequent year, you, yeah. but they still had their SWAT teams. They still did their breathalyzers. And at that point, we knew we had to get the heck out of Livonia. Did you feel a certain confirmation that this is the right thing to do, but the wrong place to do it? Did you feel like confidence was yeah. shored up in terms of the what it was if you read even if you guide, could if you could find a place to have less confrontation fred 600 people we saw as a huge success yeah here was 600 people under one tent drinking 100 percent michigan beer this wasn't a frankenmuth world of beers kind of thing which this would have been a, unheard of three four years prior yeah. right i mean we weren't like this community existed forever we're finally showcasing it we were showcasing something that was very recently on available people didn't know about it and and, and i would say and there weren't we even the breweries to pour that much beer yeah you know in say 94. we doubled by the next year because yeah, we, we were four we were, yeah yeah amazing so but we but as an organization and as rex you it was a you, success you knew we had to figure out um just yeah. how to continue it yeah and, and do it somewhere else grow it we knew it was going to grow we knew it was going to get bigger the number of breweries was keep get, kept getting bigger and i kept pushing all this, Michigan's economy was in the tank at that time. And I was saying the brewing industry was the silver lining on stormy days in yeah. Michigan. And I was just selling beer. I was, I was literally the cheerleader 
rah, rah, rah for yeah. Michigan beer yeah, and just were. every single month putting it out there. And it sold. I mean, it sold it. And it's interesting because when you look at the craft beer, I call it the Renaissance, started on the West Coast and really took off there, jumped to Colorado for obvious reasons because of, of Charlie Papazian and the Association of Brewers, which is the Brewers Association yeah. in those days, and then all the way to Michigan. How the hell did that happen? Because somebody from over there brought that whole concept and sold it over here. And we, we had a, a unified collective brewing industry here in Michigan before anybody around us did. And that's how Michigan became that number five entity on a predominantly West Coast industry. Yeah, so tell me, moving past those early days and those early festivals, this arc you just talked about, the, the fact that we came together, what do you, I guess I want to talk, I, it, you can go either way. Like, I feel like I, I'm, I'm drawn into talking about the whys and the what's, like what happened to make this, but I also want to talk about what are the things that Michigan gained from our unification? Like, what are the things that, that ended up showing up and showing up our market and making it different place to drink for consumers and, and, and making Michigan stand out uh, the most important uh, against thing, the country? The most important thing is camaraderie. Yeah. The whole rising tide lifts all boats. And that I think that I think really was the unification. And how do you think Ohio that, had a lot of and How do you think Illinois that translated though? Like, what did that do for the marketplace? What did it do for the consumers? What did it do for? Um, meaning, how does camaraderie do that? It does it because of of the flow of information, the ease of communication, and and we had, we would we. We were in a state that already had a really good wine industry because it was state funded, right? The Michigan Grape and Wine Industry Council, which has changed to embrace the other alcohols yeah. now. But they, were, they had a really solid tourism industry, whereas nobody thought you could tour a brewery. And we were putting it out there. You can tour breweries. You can call up these people and go see how they're doing it, what they're doing, and have samples of their products. And we created this not only networking the breweries into a collective voice and the camaraderie of the breweries, which I think is the key, the most important key, but we also network the enthusiast and created through festivals and through teaching people about, I must have trained 900 beer judges, having these meetings, having these, these talks and these, just elevating the study of beer in Michigan, yeah. I think is a result of that camaraderie, that collective consciousness. Because that collective consciousness, the Borg, right? It just, it just reaches out and it just spread out and it, it touched everybody. And it became a cool thing to do. Yeah. And it, it, nationwide it is. I mean, it's, it's because it is, it's nationwide. We didn't start anything here, but we populated it and propelled it. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And, um, so how did you see the, um, your engagement in terms of uh, how did your role with the Guild develop and change along with your business? And, and how did you see the Guild grow out of those early years? What, what, what was next after the first couple of festival seeds? And th then what happened? Yeah. It, the, the very beginning, it was rather self-serving, wasn't it? I wanted to start a publication about Michigan beer, and I needed a successful industry to have to write about. Yeah. So I needed to build that industry so that I could make a living with my publication. Yeah. And, and then running, being the executive director for the first two years, I saw a need to step out of it and let the guild be run by brewers and not by a writer publisher. Yeah. I approached you guys and, you know, and, and, and said, you know, either, either come up with compensation, because I'd done the first two years for free, or are you guys do it? And the board said, well, we don't have the money. We're not gonna pay you anything, so we'll just do it. And, and so I stepped out of it and I've been out of it. And then as you grew and the, 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 the festivals got more and more popular, you started to have money and you were able to, to, to pay somebody to, yeah. to fulfill that role, which is great. Scott Graham does a great job. But, and so how did you, as a, as a cheerleader and as a publisher, beer fan, a member, you know, uh, important member of the community. Could you describe kind of how you saw both the 
the brewing community change and how you saw the market change over those next it's very, 10, 12 very, years? Yes, because I, I've docu as I documented the concept of the guild and legalizing home brewing in that first 12 issues, I documented the growth of this whole industry for 22 right. years, right? I mean, we're approaching right. 22 what a, years What now. a vantage point. And it's just to see, remember when 55 IBUs was awful, bitter, <laughs> IPA, it's like, who wants that stuff? Yeah. And now 55 IBUs is like, <laughs> Bell's too hard at everyday beer, Yeah. right? It's just everyday beer. Because we can, we, we've taken, our, our palates have grown so accustomed to the extremes now that bigger, maltier, hoppier, higher alcohol, all these things and, and, uh, are what we're after. And, and it's interesting that I watched the biggest names in beer morph into Russian imperial stouts. This is the beer all the geeks like. Uh, Bell's Expedition Stout. I named it as one of one of the top five beers I've ever had. And it's like wonderful. And then the stores were called me up and said, we're out of it because I wrote this in the in the the, uh, the local paper. And um, but nobody can drink. You can't drink a six pack of Expedition Stout. But that was the most popular beer enthusiast would name Russian Imperial Stout as the best beers there were. But by what measure? Right. When you look at the fact that that the vast majority of beer consumed is light, light lagers. Yes, yeah, they weren't drinking it the most. Yeah. They considered it the, the, best. the milepost yeah. for this adventure yeah. in flavor. Yeah. It's, it's, and, then, it's, and then on a Tuesday, they, they grabbed something else. That and so we went, from, we went from IPAs being bitter, and you could have bitter at 45 IBUs. There were some awful bitter beers at 45 IBUs because it was all 60-minute boil hops. We hadn't learned the whole late edition thing. Some people were dry hopping in those days, but not to the extent we're doing all the late edition. Not to mention flavor. the hop choices were different. And the hop choices were vastly different too. So we've seen that change. Our palates have, have acclimated to stronger aromas and stronger flavors to the point where we've seen this, this fledgling industry of home brewers and this passion grow to an industry that started to, to attract entrepreneurs, investors, and, and people that, that perhaps opened breweries more because they saw it as a way to make, a, make money as opposed to, I want to brew the, great, the best beer, yeah. which became a cliche, in my opinion. I'm using only the finest ingredients. Oh, yeah. I want to make the best <laughs> beers. I'm only going to, all this kind of stuff is nonsense. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. the cliches. Yeah. But I proof, wanted to see like yada, yada, yada on next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. I yeah. Heard we it. got it. The proof is in the output. The yeah. proof is in the liquid. If the liquid's worthy, you're golden. You're solid. And I think it also, just talking about this this morning, like I think it, I think the liquid brought us together in terms of we were making great change in terms of what was available to the drinker. We were, we were correcting a marketplace that had been devastated and, and had choices removed from it. Yeah. Um, and the liquid was our call, but I also think that it it went beyond that. It, that because the because tasting rooms and and breweries and and, it, and festivals and and um, and it, people's ability to engage in the deeper story by reading Michigan Beer Guide and other things, I feel like it started to go into a much more experiential place as well, which is very important now. And maybe we can kind of fast forward a little bit because now we have the large international conglomerates making IPA and making yeah. Imperial Stouts yeah. and, and, yeah. and uh, making the liquid that was our claim to fame. And I think, but there's still something different about connecting to brewers that are still keeping this uh, torch lit that's about you know independence and entrepreneurialism and community. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe I kind of wandered off onto my own soapbox, but like, um, I feel like it became about something bigger, and, and maybe with that, can you either reflect on that and also talk about um, what do you think is important today? What, that, what do we need to keep um, around in our culture, and what do we need to add to it uh, for, for us to be, us members of it, to feel like it's what we want it to be? The interesting thing, I think the key, I don't know if this is the direct answer, but the key the key goal to the continued success of this industry right now 
is the greater conversion of the non-craft drinker to craft beer, which I thought 20 years ago was going to be automatic. It was going to be very easy to convert the Bud Miller Coors drinkers over to craft beer because once you get off of white bread, you don't go back to, to Wonder Bread. Right. right? And I just thought that was going to be automatic. What I didn't see happening was that there was going to be 400 breweries doing that in Michigan. 4,000 breweries or whatever the number yeah, is. Like, whatever the number is. 7,000. Yeah, I think we're about 7,000. Yeah, 7,000. I didn't see that happen. I didn't see that there was more breweries than Walgreens. And Walgreens are on every corner. I didn't see that happening. Yeah. And that is not a good thing for the industry. I, and I think, it will, I think that will correct. And we're already seeing this leveling off of, of the playing field right now as the double digits are gone. And we're, ha we're still going, oh, we're 5%, meaning there's growth. But it used to be 17 percent. And, and we're, some of the breweries that were banking on or had their financial models based on this double digit growth are starting to find themselves with inventory. Mm -hmm. Right. And just today I was reading how Europe is taking the leadership position in in opening breweries now up 17 percent uh, uh, last year over the year before and up. Uh, uh, but 178 percent this year. But, There's more breweries opening in Europe now than in the USA. Yeah, but I, I feel like I want to challenge some of the national and international pundits at time because I, I'm, I'm I kind of think like is growth and his number of breweries are they not really our say. metrics? No, they're to not. Health? They're like, not. Like we've been working towards these. We've been chasing other <sighs> principles that are more that are more ethereal, the, the, more cultural. The metric has always been market share. Right. We but, were seven tenths of one percent when I started. And that's because we had to correct a market. But I, I just like to challenge ourselves and say, but yeah, but our mission was always about being great and about providing, at least for me, it was like, let's be a great brewery, let's provide great choices and, and make people happy. And then sure. our measure of success is how big are we, how fast are we growing, and what's our market share? And I always found those at odds with one another of like, well, yeah, actually, because, that's because how those the are, big guys measure. That's, that's founders measure. That's yeah. exactly Founders Voice right there. Yeah. We never said we wanted to be the biggest microbrewery. We wanted to be a big brewery. Right. So their whole thing is those exact things you're talking about. How much product, how much volume, the quality of the product, and how, how broad can we cast that net? And they're yeah. doing a really wonderful job. But from, from your point of view, coming from the West Coast and saying, I saw that this was going to be big, right? And it has become big. Like you said, I saw it coming. So, and now, and you've been a, a very important scribe on all these years and, and keeping track of, of our industry and who's doing what where. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so you. You, you see this, this uh, you see the, the horizon line probably different than anybody I know. And so, um, yeah. I just wonder if you, if you can point to like, what are the, what are the other principles, or what are any principles to healthy community of brewers, even with it looking different than you thought it was going to look? If you take that all into account and you start looking towards the next 10 years, um, what do you start wishing I, for? What are you rooting I, for? I am a big proponent, and you said it earlier, of the independent as opposed to the corporate owned. I'm a big proponent of quality, and I think quality is not automatic. It was perceived, and when you're making small batches, quality can be hit and run, and it can be fairly automatic because before it goes bad, it's gone. And you could, <laughs> yeah. you could get rid of it. If you're volume brewing like on a, that one barrel at a time or two Volume a cures a lot of ills. Bro, volume cures a lot of ills. And, and um, so I think quality is more important now, and it has always been important. But now that there is this greater need for distribution and with a smarter, more intelligent consumer, you can't get away with the diacetyl laden beer. And that to me is true whether you're selling 500 Anything. barrels or 500,000 because yeah. you can be in small town USA opening a pub and only planning on serving your community. Yeah. And yeah. there's beer experts in that community now. Yeah, and there's right? beer experts in that there, community. There are people that are yeah. coming in yeah. that have a, a, a pretty yeah aware, awake and aware palate, and, and the bar has been set hot. You know, I've got an interesting, I, I, I was very instrumental in helping Mexico 
with their craft brew renaissance. When I got involved down there, there were six breweries. Now there's, last I counted, is over 200. You know, I've, I've worked with them and their uh, Cerveza Mexico and their Copa de Cerveza, which is this, their World Beer Cup. Uh, and I also got, get to go to Canada, which, you know, where I live, I go east to go to Canada. And I, <laughs> I went to Canada and in Canada, they, in both places, south of the border, north of the border, they're following what's going on, just as Europe is, what's going on in the USA. But what I just discovered in Canada was their IPAs are still the 60 minute bitter, 60, 70 IBUs, and I couldn't drink them. They're all, they're like, their IPA is where our IPA was 20 years ago. Yeah. So they have yet to embrace the late edition uh, flavor or aromatic port, you know, those last editions, or no early hop edition at all. Uh, it, was, it was very enlightening to me because it was by every definition of BJCP 20 years ago, those were IPAs. Yep. Whereas what I'm drinking today is like orange juice, hazy orange juice. I'm like, that's not even an IPA. Well, what the hell is that? Right? Yeah, we just amazing. put IPA on the end of anything now and it sells like crazy. I mean, whether it's a, it's a session or a Belgian or a black or a New England or a... Yeah. Uh, Anyway, you put IPA on it and it's so and the GABF, a, the biggest number of entries, juicy, hazy IPA. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> and a first, I don't know what metal she won, but, a, a, you know, a first year brewery, not a first year brewer, uh, but uh, Eris Brewing in Chicago, good friends of ours. Um, uh, Haley took a medal in that category, in which that category. is like first year brewery. Yeah. It's uh, crazy. Yeah. Um, so anyways, wrapping up, like yeah. from, a, from a community involvement, industry involvement, uh, putting the oar in the water to make positive change, what do you think the call to action to a, a young brewery, uh, either in planning or let's say they're open in a couple of years? Um, you, we, you've had decades of, yeah. of watching breweries succeed, fail, and do everything in between. Uh, what, what are the sage words of advice and encouragement for a, for a young brewery? Be careful right now. Right now is not a good time. If you miss the heyday, if you're, if you're trying to get into it now, it's, it, A, it's easier because the early guys did all the work in getting craft beer onto the shelf because you can find craft beer in any service station now. You can find craft beer in box stores in every supermarket. Craft beer is available all over the place, and yet it's 10% market share. Isn't that kind of a, it's an odd thing. Yeah. It's, more, it's more readily available now than it's ever been before. And yet, 28% of all beer sold today is still light, light industrial lager. Yeah. So I think it's very difficult to break into this market. And if you choose to break into this market, the hallmarks are to have the money behind you, to stay, to stay the, the, the journey, if you will, and to make, to assure every single piece of liquid you put out there is top quality. It's what you want, it's, it's what the consumer deserves, and nothing less. And with the FDA and the food programs coming in and coming about right now, uh, and the need to measure uh, nutritional ingredients for, for, for distribution, I think that these are gonna be really critical things. It's, it's not gonna be as easy. So have the money and, and assure quality. Those, that's it. Yeah. Anybody can still do it, provided you meet those criteria. Yeah. My last question, sounds like Emily has one too, is just, and, and what do you think we should be telling these breweries about getting out of their breweries and drinking each other's beer? And how does one- how, Every chance How does get. one, um, how do we shape that invitation? What's the invitation to them? It, it, it should be a, an encouragement to explore each other's beers for your own education. People often ask me, 20 years ago, Rex, how did you become a beer judge? And I say, well, I drank a lot of beers and I took a test. And I used to estimate that I had, and this was 20 years ago, 40,000 beers. There was a time when there wasn't a beer in America that I don't think I tried. That is far from the fact now. <laughs> it's, impossible. it's impossible now. But, I, but every, every GABF and all those judging sessions and all those flights and all those, and, and drinking is, 
it's like a sip here and a sip here and a sip here and a sip. And there, there's 14 beers away and then a sip here. You know what it's like at GABF. And um, I'm sorry, where was I going with that? The invitation, the, the invitation for young breweries to drink each other's beer, to drink Michigan's beer. To go beer. out and sample, and I would go beyond that. Yes, drink Michigan beer, but by every measure, drink the classics from Europe. If you want a good Hefeweizen, drink Weinsteff and Hefeweizen. And then drink all the, Mich the Michigan beer. That's the BJCP model. Here's, the, here's the, the classic examples of the style. Here's the North American copies of that style. Now try to figure out what fits the parameter. On the other hand, a beer can be completely out of any style and be a wonderful beer. Right. And that's where cleanliness, sanitation, quality has and all I also those. think if you're shooting those gaps, it's good to know where, where the gap is. Where the gap is. Well, you know, what, the, are, what are you trying to hit yeah. and how precise are you? Yeah. Emily, what do you got? So you, you talked about the industry and you talked about the breweries. Your niche has been connect, connecting the consumer to the breweries and exposing them. What is the next step generationally for that process? You know, what do we need to do to continue to connect the consumer to the Michigan industry and into beer as a whole? What needs to be done next? Okay. The interesting question is, and I would I would say connecting potential consumers. The festivals, for the most part, are reaching our consumer. They're not reaching that percentage of the population needed that doesn't go to, buy, to buy the beer off the shelf. Yeah. We have reached a carrying capacity of beer in Michigan where I'm seeing really good product getting old and oxidized on shelves. And that didn't happen before. But now I can go into a place and I can't find a fresh beer. I cannot find a fresh beer, even a high quality, fast moving beer. Yeah. Um, and I think that we have reached that point where there's more beer on the shelves and we have consumers taking it off the shelves. And the solution is more drinkers. And we need the more that are new drinkers. Yes. That, that are outside of our current yeah. circles. I, I say, I, I always, I've always encouraged, don't make Michigan beer 100% of your purchase decisions, but make it a part or a majority of your purchase decision to have the experience and to keep the money at home. But explore those other world-class beers so you have something to measure against. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, you've got blinders on and you don't know what, what the monks had in mind 500 <laughs> years ago, right? You need to know what those experiences were all about so that you can gauge how well the new industry is, is copying that or or expanding that and even even making it better because we have better technology than we've ever had before. Yeah. So there, there's still a world of opportunities. There's a huge amount of beer drinkers. Yeah. The, but the fact remains, eight out of 10 beers sold in America are Bud Miller Coors. Yeah. Labatt and, and it, you know, lot, Big Blue is Et really cetera. big in Michigan. But, yeah. but we need more of those consumers. And to get back to her, to Emily's question, we have to find a way to network those consumers through education. And, and that was my goal with the beer guy. And invitation, I think. An invitation. We, we somebody need who to get them who out doesn't there. take the step doesn't know they don't know they want to be educated. We need more. The beer guide reaches the same people. I'm not reaching the new people. You want to reach the new people, we got to get in mainstream publications. We got to get in the magazines and the media. And I'm not talking about bloggers either, because that's read by the same people. We need to get into the media. The television shows are, are one example, but they're watched by the same people. It's how do we reach the new audiences? You know, Jim Cook has done a marvelous job, like him or not like him. The guy's done a marvelous job at selling craft beer yeah. because he was spending the thousands of dollars, the hundreds of thousands of dollars to promote a product in the face of the giants yeah. when no other brewery was doing that. Yeah. Right. Nobody else. But he came from that background and he understood the value of marketing. Yeah. And, and to that, I would add that uh, that's another key part of having the money if you're getting into this industry now is you need to market your product. Beer has always been sold socially, right? It, it, yeah. it's, the, it's, the, it's the one on one. And I've said the best way to convert somebody is bring them to your kitchen table, sit down with a beer, pour it for them, tell them what they're experiencing, get past the face and keep talking <laughs> and they'll have another sip and get past that and keep talking. Don't let them. Oh, if you're in a bar that has a Budweiser, they can switch. 
and that craft beer is going bye-bye. But if they're in your home and you have control, they will drink that beer over the course of the hour you're talking to them, and, they, and they'll have another. <laughs> and they will have another. <laughs> the Rex method. Yeah, they will have another. Well, thanks for all you've done to bring Great. people to beer, yeah, Rex. Thanks for it's, thinking uh, of it, man. It's been a hell of a couple decades uh, together watching this It's not game. over yet. No, it's not. Good no. luck to you. Thank Appreciate you. all your work. Yeah. Thank you. And for sitting with us today. Yeah. Good. Thanks for listening and sharing while supporting Michigan breweries and craft beer everywhere. The Michigan Brewers Guild was formed in 1997 with its first summer beer festival taking place in July of 1998. It's now five annual festivals are dedicated exclusively to Michigan beer brewed by more than 270 member breweries. The Michigan Brewers Guild exists to promote and protect the passionate Michigan beer industry in every way possible. To learn more, visit us at mibeer.com or say hello on one of our social media pages as we love hearing from you. From coast to coast, from far and near, Let's drink Michigan beer. Let's drink Michigan beer.